Niger Delta region of Nigeria is made up of uh, nine states and the core states of the Niger Delta are actually six which are Delta State, uh, Edo State, Bayelsa State, River State, Cross River State and Aqua Ibom. As we all know Nigeria is the eighth largest oil uh, producing country in the world and the largest oil producing country in Africa and 98% uh, of this oil is coming from the Niger Delta region. Niger Delta region basically uh, make up 90% uh, of Nigerian foreign revenue earning. But unfortunately, uh, the people live in penury and uh, because they live under one US dollar per day, uh, the World Bank have actually uh, used that as the benchmark for uh, the poverty uh, level and now what we see we have uh, the presence of huge multinational oil companies who are actually extracting oil in the Niger Delta we have companies like Shell we have Chevron we have uh, Elf we have any we have mobile Texaco and name them uh, but they have this joint venture with the Nigerian government who are actually, I mean, the oil companies are the operators of this uh, oil venture. In this episode, I want to take the audience through uh, some of the sufferings of these people who live in this community. I've been there myself because I come from Delta State and, uh, and I also grew up in a town called Ugeli where I still have my brothers and I still have my uncles, but unfortunately, uh, my father and my mother is no longer, they're no longer alive. So um, sometimes when I travel to the Niger Delta to, to cover some of these uh, areas, I do visit my home with my visitors so that they will know where I actually come from. Um, so, but you know, as a child growing up in Nigeria, I was opportuned to see the devastation. Like in the Niger Delta, we have like around 6,000 kilometers of pipeline crisscrossing the Niger Delta area. And most of these pipelines are very old. Some of them were actually put in there for more than 35, 40 years, and they've not been changed. And uh, unfortunately also, most of them are running above the ground so which makes it vulnerable to sabotage and in most cases some of these pipelines are either corrosive and thereby leading up to i mean after oxidation process taking place on them uh, they start to leak and so when crude runs through them there is spills so most of these communities have actually had to suffer uh, from oil spills which have devastated the environment uh, thereby uh, rendering the environment uh, very un very uh, unhealthy for the production of crops. And we must understand also that in the Niger Delta, the major occupation of our parents, and even now, I mean, the youth, is actually farming and fishing. But unfortunately, due to pollution uh, resulting from oil spills on the environment, the the soil are no longer having the, the necessary nutrients uh, to make them cultivate the way we've known our environment in terms of cultivation over the years. And also, uh, some of these oil spills also or takes place in the water. And so they have destroyed the aquatic life of the water that fishing, which used to be the uh, occupation of the people, have actually uh, been taken away from them. I've seen uh, I've witnessed cases where if we travel with speedboats through the water, uh, the people have to go deeper into the sea to see how they can source for uh, fish for themselves. So it is really uh, an unfortunate uh, situation in that area. And sometimes uh, during excavation of oil by this oil company, there was actually a community called Obe that we visited some time ago. We met this family. Uh, half of their building, which was constructed out of mud, mud sand, uh, collapsed. And they said, well, it collapsed during uh, the geological uh, excavation process that took place when they had to explode the ground. 
and so it affected the building and it collapsed and they've been fighting since 2001 to see that the oil company at least compensates them so that they can uh, put the building back in order but unfortunately nothing has happened so they've had to live their life like that the gunshot did uh, this thing damaged my house the well everything which i don't wish then i went to them so they they promised me they are coming till now about eight years ago nothing done and we also know of the processes of gas flaring where gas is flare and when this gas is flare, the heat that comes out of these glasses, uh, gases usually affect the roof of uh, uh, the people's building. So the zinc that they have, most of the time, do not last as a result of the gas flaring. And the gas flaring also leads to acid rain. When there is rain, because majority of the people living in the community, because they don't have good water, uh, they have to rely on rainwater to drink. And so when it rains, the wind tend to blow the carbon contents of the gas flaring to mix up with the with the uh, with the water with the rain and so this is what basically the people are drinking we we had to go through that process too but you know as a child growing up then uh, i didn't know any other word so we felt that was normal and also on the pipelines that are running around sometimes when it's in the evening we have to get some cool air because there is no electricity we normally usually spread our clothes on top of the pipelines and then we have to sleep. Unknowing to us, we were actually sleeping on top of a pipeline that was carrying crude oil, which was also very devastating. I've been to a community in, in, in Bielsa states where uh, the people have uh, two deep offshore oil field, which is called the, the, the Bonga oil field and the uh, EA oil field. And in combined capacity, those oil feed produces around 350,000 barrels of crude oil per day. But unfortunately, these people have no electricity. They don't have good water to drink. And I mean, we, we were taken through uh, a small, uh, f about uh, four communities living together, managing from a very small well where the water gets finished early, more early in the morning and they have to drink from those muddy water and I mean it's it's really shocking and devastating that a community like that that has so much uh, resources will have to live in that kind of uh, situation. <laughs> Look at the water we are drinking, see my stomach. At the water we drink with this show, they could not go help us. Every small, small uh, house is for town. Now they use tap, they make free clean water, now they drink. About. Look at me, chief. A whole, a whole high chief. They drink this water. Every day at the porch. Every day at the porch. If you see my porch, when I go run away from this place, it's caused by this water. So we're going to come. All of us join together. Come and help us for this. Uh, look at the place. Now, no block building, nothing. Look at this. This is the houses. But we are we are host community to so many oil, so many oil companies, uncountable oil. companies operating in our territory. Dodo, Not, River. Dodo River. Which you people know better? This is Dodo River, Belabri community. Belabri one. We have Belabri two there. And there are so so, so other communities. We are dying. Road, nothing was done. Come, no, no better road. No, no hospital. hospital. Town hall, not to nothing. develop nothing, nothing. So please, please, all the companies, federal government, everybody, please come to help us, come to come to our aid. We don't beg tire, and so beg we beg every day and night, no response. So we, this is what we're gonna be showing, and uh, and so you hear, we've we've met the elders, we've met the kings, we've met uh, the youths, and everybody keep complaining and they keep blaming the oil companies. <laughs> You know, the oil companies, they have a, their share of the blame. The Nigerian government, they also have their share of the blame. And together we believe that with the resources coming out of these areas, these people should have been living in a much more uh, better condition. Okay, we have about 34 warehouses here. 
they, they take gas here and they take crude oil here from our community here. NGC. We have NGC here too. And we don't have any, no development in my community. The market they built for us, the market have collapsed. Light, light. Then we don't have light, we don't no, have water. No, no we water. buy water to drink every day here. We, we have a private borehole that we buy water from, from this community. So we, we are begging share to help us. Uh, <coughs> my name is Godwin Amoregi, the Okagale of this community. I am the Okagale of this community as a tattoo man. You see my community, I don't know what actually happened. When we have resources here to develop our community, and we are still suffering, we are in darkness anyway. Let me just put it like that, that we are in darkness. We have cried and cried and cried. There's nothing, no achievement, nothing, nothing. Like our school is, is not good, no water, no electricity. no electricity, there is nothing. There was even, uh, I think in 2010, uh, one of the members of the Dutch parliament uh, from the Socialist Party, Sharon Hesthauser, um, had to make a visit to the Niger Delta and I facilitated that trip uh, by accompanying her to, to the Niger Delta area. And it was very uh, shocking to her when we went to the same urban community and we got to a gas flare location. Very shocking to see it happening for real. And uh, you can feel the heat now. It's tremendous. And it's very hard to imagine that this goes on day and night, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for years and years and years. Whereas we just drove through some communities uh, where little children were walking around and where a lot of men and women were living in very simple circumstances. And I could remember her telling me, asking me, you know, how long has the gas been flaring? So I told her to ask the people of the community. And they said the gas has been flaring since 1974. And that gas has been flaring at a temperature of 1,200, 1,300 degrees, which is very devastating. But as a child growing up, we, you know, because there was no electricity in those communities, we didn't have light. Uh, most of the time, we even celebrated the gas flaring uh, situation because we saw it as a source of light. Because when it flared, I mean, 2,000 meters away from the flaring site, you can see very clearly like it's in the daytime, but unknown to us, uh, it was actually killing our health because we were, in, we were inhaling the carbon content uh, from, from, from the gas flare. And so, and unfortunately also, the oil companies did not really carry out uh, um, uh, the, the environmental impact assessments, you know, uh, by educating us on the danger of such gas flaring. Our parents, our mother, used to go very close to the gas flaring sites to use the heat to even dry fishes, meats, and other uh, valuable food items that are usually meant for consumption. So uh, that was still ignorance, you know. And uh, just early this year, I remember I had an interview with uh, uh, a Nigerian ambassador and who comes from Bayelsa State. And he told me that you know his first experience with uh, with uh, uh, an oil spill was so surprising to him and his friends that they had to go into the water, you know, to swim in it because they they, they fell in love with the color of the crude on top of the water. So when they came out, their body was sh was shining. So they ran to the village, you know, to tell their other friends that, oh, you need to come and see. You know, look at my body, my body is shining, you know. So, and the other youths, they joined them, they went to the water, and they uh, actually, you know, uh, <laughs> swam in the crude oil. So, unknowing to them, they were actually causing problems for their skin. But that tells you the level of awareness, you know, that we had uh, at the time. And I remember also talking to uh, Timmy Priyasiva, the former governor of Bayelsa State, and he told me one thing that, you know, the first uh, incident of gas flare in their community was far back many years ago when a woman who went to the river in the night to fish saw uh, oil spill coming out. So she didn't know what the oil spill was about. 
So she took her, you know, local lantern with fire and went very close to the OSP to see if she can if she can look at it, you know, so and immediately she got close, the thing went into flame and she got burnt. So she even got burnt, they did not even know that it was the the the, the crude that was spilling from the pipe that got contact with the with the with the flame of the of the of the lantern uh, that led to the explosion. So you see, so so these are people who have uh, stories to tell about their first initial experience with oil spills and even with gas flaring. In some communities, they strongly believe that when you even use crude oil to rub your body around, it can prevent gunshot from penetrating your skin. So people also use them. So these were all caused by the fact that uh, the oil companies and even the Nigerian government refused to educate us on the danger and the environmental implication of living around uh, a spill location and also of living around a gas flaring uh, uh, location. So, you know, now, you know, in the late 50s, when these oil companies came to Nigeria, they actually went into these communities. I remember Oloibiri very well, which was the first place shell struck oil. You know, what they've left behind now in Oloibiri is what you call the marginal oil field. They've abandoned the place, they've left the place. I would have expected, like we see with Heineken in Amsterdam, you know, the company where it has become the first uh, place where they, they first of all distill beer. I would have expected that sort of thing to happen in Oloibiri. I mean, sort of like a tourist attraction, uh, create some, you know, beautiful scenes around the first uh, oil, well, um, oil well that they drill from and even use it to attract tourists to come to those communities. That can also create job opportunities for uh, the youth around there because, you know, when you have a tourist attraction, people make t-shirts that they sell, people make banners, people make stickers. You know, this can also generate some sort of income for some of the youths who are jobless, who don't have anything to uh, uh, to live from and you know another problem is that you know you have the presence of uh, huge multinational oil companies around those communities and without those community youths being uh, actively engaged in terms of uh, job process which is also a very sad situation so we've been to the dodo river community recently and and most of the youths were complaining of not being employed. And we saw youths who were actually graduates. And even if they are not graduate, there are other, there are many departments in the oil and gas sector that you can uh, engage the community youths and even give them vocational training so that they can be, because when they are active, then you can reduce restiveness in those, uh, in those places. I mean, some oil bearing communities don't even have schools and where you see school buildings it's either lacking in infrastructure there are no teachers no no chairs uh, half of the school buildings are all gone they've they've collapsed the roofs have you know caved in and so uh, some of the youths who even have to go to school will have to really travel very far to go to school so I think, you know, we need to let people uh, see the suffering of, uh, of uh, these people who live in these places where they are usually, usually uh, supposed to be blessed with resources. There are many people in the villages who are waiting for the outcome of this hearing. Last week we saw the, um, the, the, our episode in which we, we covered the illegal oil bunkery situation and we got to also see the, um, the extent of damage on the environment and just recently uh, there was uh, a court ruling in, in the United Kingdom in which uh, uh, Shell was actually uh, uh, the ruling uh, was that um, Shell can do more uh, to protect the environment of the Niger Delta, I mean, by cleaning and remediating the environment of the Niger Delta. And I want to also believe that 
I mean, the oil companies should be liable to oil spill situation that have devastated the environment of the people of the Niger Delta. We can agree also that there are some cases of sabotage situation, but then, I mean, when you have your pipelines running above the ground instead of buried in the ground, then you also expose those pipelines to people to vandalize. So, I mean, it should be your duty of care to um, ensure that your pipelines are well protected to avoid people from coming to hack at your pipeline. And I believe that in the 21st century with satellite devices, with highly technical uh, equipment, uh, the oil companies can do better in terms of protecting this pipeline from being sabotaged. However, we still have uh, the situation where there are genuine cases of oil spills resulting from uh, 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 pipelines that are old and not replaced. And these pipelines uh, should have been replaced, but where they are not replaced and rain keep beating them and heat keep falling on them, oxidation process takes place. Uh, they're bound to start to leak and when they start to leak, they open up. And when they open up, what we get is oil spills. And in those cases, I think the oil companies should stand up and, and take responsibility for that and remediate the environment. I mean, particularly when it affects people's farmland, remediate the environment and, and pay them compensation for the, uh, for the devastated uh, environment. Because, of course, farming is a major occupation of the people and fishing is also a major occupation of the people. So with that, we can, we can avoid a lot of legal battles that are taking place now because the oil companies are refusing to take responsibility for such such uh, pollution. So, you know, I mean, when you look at the environmental uh, consequences resulting in, in health problems uh, for the people, I mean, it is also good to give them access to uh, Medicare, I mean, hospitals, because we see that most of these communities in the Niger Delta are deeply rooted in the creek area where means of transportation are usually very difficult. I mean, a journey from Wari in Delta states uh, to Bilabiri in, in, in Bayestas, it can take as much as four hours. And in those communities, they don't have hospitals. So which means that if anybody falls sick, uh, the person will have to be transported for four hours to come to the nearest hospital, which is in the city. And then when they come to the city, do they even have money to pay for their hospital bill? No. Do they even have somebody to accommodate them in those areas? No. So these are some of the challenges that these people face. And I think the government owe it as a duty through the local government uh, council uh, to be able to put up infrastructure, put up social amenities that can alleviate the suffering of the people of, uh, of, of the Niger Delta. So. But what we now see in the Delta is what we now see amongst the people, not only in the Niger Delta, but also in Nigeria as a whole, is that they have decided, the people have decided to hang on to their faiths, like the Christians. So when they don't have money and they don't have hospital to go to, they prefer to go to the church. So they believe that when they have faith and they keep praying, they keep fasting, God will answer them and God will heal them. And so that is what we see now in the Niger Delta, which is very unfortunate because, I mean, for miracle to happen to you, you need to take steps also to, first of all, treat yourself. Uh, underlining uh, point, which is very strong and which I uphold very highly among the people, is the fact that in that suffering situation, you still see kids smiling, you still see the people smiling, you still see them trying to live as happy people and that is very encouraging and i think uh, the whole problems that has led to insecurity in the area that has led to militancy in the area uh, that has led to criminality in the area can be avoided if only the government take responsibility for what they're supposed to do to the people and also the oil companies take responsibility for what they're supposed to do in terms of meeting the social corporate responsibility principles. Through the process of so-called cleaning, forests are set on fire and impacted environment is further impacted. Rivers are even set on fire. We have cases of rivers. So if you go to the Delta mm. and you see fire, don't jump into the river. 
Because the river may be the one that will go on fire yeah. if, if it bursts yeah. in flames next. So we have the problems of pollution destroying the land and destroying the waterways. People yeah. don't have water to drink. People are thirsty. The fishermen have to depend on imported fish. Now, if you go to most of the places in Delta, you are going to be eating ice fish, yeah, sure. not fresh fish caught from the rivers. You have people who cannot have fresh water to drink, but have to depend on water taken from elsewhere or polluted water because there is no choice. I mean, recently, recently I was at Awoye in Ilaje, in Ondo State. Their fresh water system has been polluted by salt water from the ocean because Chevron opened up canals to take the equipment inland and completely overturn the fresh water system. So even the fishes they used to catch, they have to go to the high seas now. And they will go many days to the high seas and come back with nothing. We must not rule out the issue of corruption um, in, within the government that has actually uh, affected the people. Because when you look at the Niger Delta states, you, you will agree with me that uh, they have 13% derivation which accrue to them outside the, uh, the usual uh, budget uh, allocated to the states. And then we have intervention agencies like the NDDC, the Niger Delta Development Commission. We have the Department of Petroleum Resources and we have uh, NOSDRA. We have all of these agencies that are saddled with the responsibility to carry out some of these uh, interventions uh, that would at least help the life, help improve the lives of the people that live in those environments. So, but uh, most times what we see is that due to corruption and, and, and politics, uh, these people are either underfunded or funded and money being diverted to other, for other purposes which has made them not to function the way they're supposed to function. So I think with the budget to the Niger Delta states, uh, we should have been living a life uh, that is far better than what we're currently living uh, right now. So, I mean, the corruption has actually played a role in the suffering of the people of uh, the Niger Delta. So I think, you know, when you drill uh, oil in a community, you must take the environment very seriously and you must take the life of the people who live in that community very seriously. And if you can put these two together and act, you know, using internationally accepted standard uh, like it is in the Netherlands uh, and you apply it in Nigeria, I mean, we're sure going to see improvement in the life of the people. I've actually, I mean, in the times of uh, uh, the militancy, when uh, militants uh, stood up and said, well, they're tired of the suffering and they want the oil companies to leave the Niger Delta. Yeah, we were at the creek and I met uh, one of the commanders then who expressed his, uh, his frustration. We have major fields around this area. But if you get to the fields, the fields just looks like paradise. But in the Oost communities, where they, are, where they get their oil, the communities, I mean, the people are living in abject poverty. I mean, debt is even better than the people. Uh, the corruption is actually, uh, that is also affecting people of the Niger Delta, is actually coming from the Niger Delta people themselves. So I think these are, these are areas we need to look at and find a way you know, to make sure that uh, whatever the state gets in terms of revenue, it's put into infrastructural development, as it is said, or as it is stated in the budget. So these are these are some of the challenges that the community people are facing, and the people the community itself is facing in terms of uh, the effects of oil extraction on on their lives, and also. Uh, the impact on their source of livelihood. Thank you for staying tuned. We hope you have enjoyed watching the show. See you same day, same time, next week.